Hey there, I thought I would make a video just talking about stuff. I moved my 10 channel amp, which is not finished yet, down to my listening room uh, the other day. And that was to get it out of the shop here uh, so I can start on other projects, namely woodworking projects, because in case you don't know, if all you've been watching is this channel, I'm mainly a woodworker. That's how, um, you know, I got started on YouTube uh, 12 years ago doing woodworking projects and I've been doing them ever since. And uh, you'll find those on my main channel. You'll find a link to that in the description or at the end of the video. It's up on the end screen. So anyway, yeah, I moved the 10 channel amp down to my listening room to start using it. <laughs> even though it's not finished. And if you've been watching all along, this may seem familiar because I did the exact same thing with the um, four channel subwoofer amp that I built almost two years ago that's still down there working, like being used every day, but it still doesn't have a front panel and I still need to do some stuff on the inside. But it is fully functional and I'm using it every day. And that's really, at the end of the day, that's all it counts, right? I can always get around to making the front panel. And actually I was gonna make the front panel for that amplifier before I finished the 10 channel one. Now getting back to the 10 channel one, I, um, I finished it enough to bring down to set up and get started using it and I did that, I brought it down, I started setting it up. And part of that process is to adjust the levels of the eight crossovers that uh, feed the eight amplifiers that drive my open baffle four ways. Okay, and in doing that, I don't have it here because it's down in the basement. And the one I was supposed to use is was out here when I was too lazy to come and get it, let this be a lesson for you. Um, to adjust those levels, you need a screwdriver. The screwdriver I, I got was one that was in my electronics room, one of the all metal uh, precision screwdrivers. And the one I should have used has a plastic handle on it. It's not all metal. Anyway, the, <laughs> the screwdriver slipped out of my fingers, which I don't know if this is the case with you, if you're older. Have you found that you're more clumsy? Oh, I definitely am. And it slipped out of my fingers. Part of that was doing it with my left hand. I'm not as, uh, I'm pretty good with my left hand, but I'm not as, as competent as I am with my right. Slipped out of my fingers, fell down inside, where the amplifiers are and it shorted something out on the first one. And I heard a pop and I saw a little whiff of smoke <laughs> and uh, quickly disconnected the power and all the time swearing. I can't even say the words here on camera. And I'll, be, I'll be booted off of YouTube. They were so foul. Anyway, so as it turns out, what the pop I heard was the fuses. They blew. And the smoke, I assume, was, was from those. But as it turns out, it might not have been. So I stupidly, very stupidly, just replaced the fuses. And then I restarted the amplifier. And as soon as I did, like it wasn't a pop this time, but it was a loud bang. And this was the output transistors on that first board blowing out. So I lost, I lost a channel. It's no longer a 10 channel amplifier. It's now a nine channel amplifier, at least for now. All right. And as it turns out, I really don't need 10 channels anyway. I really, what I really need are, ten, are nine. I need the eight for my active four ways and I need another one for the, um, for the, um, what is that bass shaker in my listening position 
seat. Okay, so yeah, I burned that out and I had to, uh, then I had to take it all apart uh, to uh, make sure that nothing else was damaged. Because okay, that first pop and blowing the fuses was one thing. The second one was a lot more violent. Okay, a lot more violent and I couldn't be sure. So I had to take it all apart to check everything and move the last board on that side. It was the uh, left side of the amp, uh, the front amplifier there. That's the one that blew out. I took the one from the back, which is another auxiliary channel amp, and I moved it up front to replace that one. So I got four on this side and I still have five on the other side. So that took most of a full day taking that all apart. So anyway, yeah, that was the only amplifier that blew. Thank goodness. I checked. I had to. I had to check every other one. And uh, that took a long time, like I said, most of a day. But eventually I got it done. I got it put back together and um, crossed my fingers on both hands, held my breath and switched it on and it was good and I continued setting it up. So the setup process, like I said, was to adjust the levels of each of the crossovers. And I did that. Um, I started doing that, of course, before the, the burnout. I did all that on the, on the left side and, I, and then I did it on the right side to match. And all the while I was doing this, I was running measurements, of course. And before I, I um, I did any of this before I brought the amplifier down to my listening room. I set up the microphone in the, you know, to measure the left speaker. That's everything I, I went off that. Okay. Uh, and I ran measurements on the setup as it was before with the mini DSP setup. So if you're unfamiliar, what I was running was a mini DSP four by 10. Uh, that's a big, <laughs> you know, electronic crossover, digital crossover. And that was feeding two um, retail receivers. Uh, the first one, the first six channels, you could say, are were going to a Yamaha, a older home theater receiver. Uh, the other two channels for the, for the four ways were going to an Onkyo two channel receiver. And as I already said, the subwoofers that I have in the room are being powered by the other homemade amp that I have. Also, I have another homemade amp in the room uh, that I didn't blow up <laughs> and that I did finish too. That powers the side speakers and that uh, are meant to replicate reflections. Okay, so I'm going to show you some uh, plots in here that kind of illustrate how I went about this and the accuracy that I was able to get switching from the digital crossover to the analog one. Now this first one that you're looking at here is the woofer on the left side. The digital DSP is the red trace and the analog is the blue trace. And as you can see, they're a very close match with the digital system still in place. I measured each individual drivers and then the total output. So I would have that to go through and it would be the woofer, the mid woofer, the mid range and the tweeter one after the other. So this next trace that you're looking at here is the mid woofer. And as you can see, once again, it's a very close match to the digital one, the DSB one. That's the trace in red and the new analog filter is the trace in blue. Next is the mid range. And once again, very close to the digital setup. And lastly is the tweeter. And once again, very close to the digital setup. Now, after I had all of them done like that, I ran a, uh, I ran them all together. Like I had them all switched on so I could get a total output. And that's what I'm showing right now. Once again, the red trace is the say original digital setup and the blue trace is the analog setup. 
And I know I'm saying this over and over again, but once again, they are very close to each other. So that was that. Now, I still didn't have the um, woofers, the subwoofers taken care of. The subwoofers were also come like being driven from the DSP, the mini DSP. So what I did instead was I hooked them up full range and I just drove them like that for the first night. And the problem with that is it's giving me the bass that I want, the subwoofer bass, but it's also putting out a lot of, of uh, higher frequency stuff, you know, in, in the lower mid range and the, and, and the actual mid range. So that was screwing up my response a bit. So I, I couldn't live with that too long. And I did what I should have done before, which is I made another couple of crossover boards to put in the amp as well. And as it turns out, I had space for them because when I was doing that upper shelf for the crossover boards, I screwed up and I started in the wrong spot uh, with the studs on the end when I should have moved over one. But as it turns out, I used them anyway because I made these two new boards for the subwoofers and I put those in so that I could drive the subwoofers in stereo as well. So you're getting the left channel going to the subwoofer board over here and the right channel going to the subwoofer board over here. And those are feeding my four channel uh, subwoofer amplifier. The um, subwoofer amplifier, in case you're unfamiliar, is four channel because I have four subwoofers in the front wall of my infinite baffle subwoofers. So um, subwoofer board, the crossover point for that is 80 hertz on the high side. And I also um, did a high pass at 15 hertz. That's to cut off any subsonics. Now I need to make one more <laughs> crossover board for the um, for the, uh, I keep forgetting what the name of that is, Bass Shaker. That's in my uh, listening chair. And that one will be crossed at 100 and it won't have any subsonic uh, uh, filter. So it'll get everything that is available from whatever track it's listening, it's being fed. You know, so movie soundtracks often have a lot of really, really low bass that's that n not very many subwoofers can handle well but a bass shaker will so it's getting everything and that will be that um, amplifier number nine in the 10 channel or nine channel amp that's what i'll be using that one for oh before i go i'm going to talk a little bit about the um, multi-mid project and that's what i've come to think of it as um, this is the old baffle with four. I made the new baffle with six. I had a lot of comments from people saying it's patented by Tecton. Um, I can't say that the, like I had seen that speaker set up before, but I've, I've also seen similar things other places. So I can't say that that is a hundred percent the inspiration for it, but it really doesn't matter anyway. Whatever he's doing there, whether it's patented or not, it really doesn't apply to what I'm doing here. I'm anything I'm building is for my own purposes. I'm not, you know, I'm not going into production building speakers that have that kind of array. Uh, not that it's the same anyway, it's a mid range array, but it's using actual mid ranges. His uses tweeters. So that's substantially different. Um, yeah, patents don't apply here unless I was going to go into production, like set up a factory for building those speakers and selling them or making plans for them or something like that in some way commercializing the idea. OK, that's not what I'm doing. I'm building these for my own personal use and mostly for my own personal curiosity, because I was thinking about it and thinking about it. And I said, I'm going to, I got to try that at some point I've got to try it. So I was, you know, most of the way through my 10 channel amp build. And it occurred to me that maybe I should order the drivers for it. So I did, I ordered eight for this configuration. And just this morning I ordered four more to make it a six, 
uh, mid-range configuration instead of four with the same tweeter in the middle. Now, uh, the other thing I was thinking about was um, instead of using a port with the drive, with the woofer, I would get a passive radiator. And then, I, you know, I was looking at the prices of passive radiators and I said, wow, like for the price of a passive radiator, I can get another woofer. So that's what I did. I ordered two new woofers, not very expensive ones. They're like 45 bucks each um, SB acoustics. So not bad. They're a pretty good match also for the one I already have. The one I have is a more expensive, a much more expensive actually, C's um, REX 21, whatever that number was. I'll put the thing back up on the screen here again. Yeah, it's a very close match to that. A little lower sensitivity, but it will give that extra sensitivity boost with the one that I have when they're wired in um, parallel. And also there'll be two. So I haven't decided whether the two of them will be on the front or whether one will be on the front and one will be on the back. But one thing's for certain, I'll have to make the box bigger to accommodate it. So yeah, that's an update, quick update on this. I'm going to go ahead with the project. Like I said, um, mainly, I guess, in the description of that on last video, uh, I don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, probably, you know, a few months from now when everything else I've got going on is kind of clued up or at least clued up to my satisfaction. Yeah, that's when I'll get around to doing that.